so much intelligence and so much information around me. Um, I think we should dive right into it. Uh, from your uh, sheets, I think you all know well uh, the panelists and their great experiences. It's a privilege to have so much intelligence in one room. And um, I'm not going to spend any time, uh, since we only have an hour, uh, with a, a long preamble. So I'm, instead, I'm going to pose one general question and one specific question to, to each of the panelists. If I could start with uh, you, uh, uh, FBI Director Robert Mueller. The general question to all the panelists is how to deal with this new issue of, of the unknowns. After 9-11, uh, a lot of attention has been paid to scenarios that people imagine. They've been written about in newspapers. Everyone's got their favorite scenario. It's become almost a cocktail party game. And you have to deal with the analysts that come to you with, with those possibilities. So how does someone in your position deal with this empowerment of, of the extreme scenario? And the specific question uh, to you, sir, is about Osama bin Laden. Uh, not so many days ago, he said that the al-Qaeda organization was uh, preparing another attack on the United States. And if you could assess for us the likelihood that you have found or are aware of uh, the possible uh, existence of an al-Qaeda cell in the United States and how worried you are about that specific threat from Osama bin Laden. Well, let, me, let me start by uh, looking at the title of the, this forum, which is What Keeps You Awake at Night? And I think quite probably I mean, most of us here I would say it's the same scenario, and that is uh, a nuclear device, uh, improvised or otherwise, in the hands of some a terrorist group that has no compunction about using it. Uh, against your, your population. And from that, there are gradations of uh, uh, concerns, whether it be anthrax or biological or chemical attack or uh, a suicide attack, uh, uh, another suicide attack within the United States. Uh, and you cannot live and work day in and day out uh, focused on the general threat, but uh, I get down to specifics. Uh, I, I, what is the, the threat information that you have on this day? Uh, not just in the United States, but around the world. And in particular, uh, what can we do to shore up our defenses against such a threat on the one hand, and on the other hand, determine uh, where that threat is in the United States. And for us, it's a combination of addressing that threat with building up our capabilities uh, within the United States of pulling together information. Uh, in the past, uh, uh, you say intelligence uh, agencies here, we have been uh, perceived as being a law enforcement agent, and we certainly have over the years of our existence. And, but uh, after September... Just in the title, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but uh, what we've had to do is look at uh, information as information, not intelligence information or law enforcement information, and break down the walls that separates and categorizes information in this way so that we have a free flow of information between the intelligence community and the law enforcement community and are not directed to specifically to bringing to justice those who are responsible for an attack but, but uh, preventing an attack. And we have a number of mechanisms in the United States that we use to do that, joint terrorism task forces on which uh, ourselves and the intelligence community sit. But as important uh, to addressing the threat in this way is understanding globalization and the impact on what we do. Uh, I think the next session you probably have uh, Tom Friedman here, who uh, has written uh, uh, The Earth is Flat, uh, Alexis and the Olive Tree, and talks about globalization in a number of arenas, the finance, uh, manufacturing, like, but also in terms of uh, the criminal and the terrorist, uh, and the narcotics trafficker can pass through and across borders with impunity. And for us, success means partnerships, partnerships within the United States, partnerships outside the United States with our counterparts uh, overseas, and breaking down those walls within our various judicial systems to allow that free exchange of information that will now us, uh, enable us to both analyze the threat and mitigate the threat. Thank you. Um, August Hanning, uh, the uh, German interior minister, you uh, have a big challenge on your hands in Germany, uh, which has been the locus of, of some of the 
uh, arrests and, and work together of some of the extremist organizations. Um, my question to you would be, you know, how much success are you having in dealing with the fact that your country has been such a place, and more generally, how to deal with this uh, possibility of, of uh, unknown scenarios being presented to you on a regular basis? At, at first, uh, thank you for the promotion. I'm not the minister, but I'm uh, well, the deputy, deputy of the minister. But State have, Secretary, sorry. <laughs> but you have asked uh, our German experience. Uh, of course, we have got a wake-up call uh, on September 11th. It was a big surprise for us that there has been a group in Hamburg who have uh, prepared this uh, attacks in uh, New York. And I think it was not only a wake-up call for Germany, it was a wake-up call for all Western intelligence organizations. And uh, we have seen that this group uh, has managed to prepare this attack without uh, being uh, coming to knowledge to us, to the intelligence services. And uh, they have managed to train themselves uh, in the United States and elsewhere. And I think uh, we have uh, done a lot. We have uh, drawn consequences. We have improved our intelligence work in Germany. You know in Germany we have a special problem. We are a federal organized state with a lot of authorities tackling uh, terrorism, um, more than 30. And we have established a new anti-terrorism center in Berlin. I think it works very well. And we have uh, established a new culture of cooperation inside Europe and, of course, with all the Western intelligence services. But I think cooperation, of course, is very important. But you have to do your homework. Uh, you have to know what happens inside your country. And before September 11th, we have in Germany been very cautious on behalf of religious groups, on behalf of mosques. And therefore, we have a lot of uh, so-called uh, white, white uh, plaques and, and problems. And uh, yes, uh, we have uh, now reorganized our work. We have uh, got, of course, more resources. And I think we have made it far more difficult for these groups to prepare further terrorist attacks. But, uh, of course, the threat uh, is still there, and we have all to do our utmost to preserve our po uh, population for further uh, terrorist attacks. And again, we do our best. And the most important point, and Robert has mentioned it, is information. We have to collect information in order to be in the position to undertake the necessary measures by law enforcement and by other forces. Thank you. To stay uh, in Europe, uh, if I could turn to uh, Guy de Vries, who's the counterterrorism coordinator for the uh, Council of the European Union. The issue of the walls uh, coming down, it's clear to an outsider that after September 11th, political leaders uh, ordered their intelligence uh, officers and their intelligence directors and their law enforcement people to work together because of the dramatic nature of September 11th. But you uh, must, in your job, be something of an expert on human behavior and whether uh, those orders uh, can stay in place. And do they, are they subject uh, to political differences? The obvious one coming to mind, Iraq. Did the differences between European, some European countries and the United States and between, within each other affect in any way the enthusiasm with which countries worked with each other in, in this other area? Well, to, to start with, with your last point, that, that is not my impression. My impression is that even though opinions differed considerably within Europe and between some European countries and the United States about the war in Iraq in itself, there has consistently been very pragmatic, solid, uh, and productive cooperation between the uh, uh, security services and between the police forces of both sides. Uh, and that went both ways. I think that's, that's, that's positive. In general, if I look at how the European countries, plus the EU on the one hand and the US, have worked together in the fight against terrorism, I'd say this is one of the 
the unsung success stories of the transatlantic relationship that extends to questions like homeland security, transport security, uh, container security, and so on and so forth. About the wall, well, of course, security intelligence agencies are naturally reluctant to share information. If that information should fall in the wrong hands, that might directly endanger the lives of those who provided it. So there is a good reason for that. But we've seen a significant increase in European cooperation in addition to the transatlantic dimension. Uh, we've seen it at analytical level. There is now for the first time a center in Brussels at EU level where the European security services and the intelligence services share their analysis of the terrorist threat, both as it relates to the inside of the European Union and the wider global arena. This has never happened before. This is now happening since, uh, since last year. But we've also seen an increase in cross-border cooperation bilaterally and with some real successes. Spain and France together, by sharing information, have dealt a major blow to ETA. Um, Germany and France, a couple of years ago, managed to prevent a major attack on the Christmas market in Strasbourg. And the Algerians who were involved in that attack have been arrested uh, and convicted, both in Germany and France. Uh, in December, we've seen a case in Ireland where an Algerian has been convicted, uh, Mr. Boutrap, to six years imprisonment on the basis of information exchange and cooperation between France, Holland, Ireland, and also Europol. So I think, by and large, the trend is up. But uh, it, will, it will demand consistent attention from the organizations and from political leaders for this trend to, to continue. There's no doubt about that. There's been a very interesting phrase in the 9-11 Commission report, which, of course, was written with the United States in mind, but I think that lesson applies globally. And that is that we should move from a culture based on the need to know to a culture based on the need to share. That is easier said than done, but it's certainly the right direction. Thank you. Um, Secretary Chert Chertoff, you, uh, as the uh, leader of a new organization, must be particularly subject to people giving you their own ideas about homeland security in the United States. So perhaps you could take a crack at the, the question of, of the unknown extreme scenario. And, and in addition, uh, the probably the most discussed scenario, which uh, I'll be of particular interest uh, perhaps to business people here of how you get the chemical industry to uh, play a more constructive role on the security side, even though it's going to cost money. <clears throat> well, you're right. The challenge in a, in a new organization is you get a lot of unsolicited advice. I get it sometimes when I'm walking down the street. Um, but the fundamental challenge we face is how do you manage risk? And at any given month, based on what's going on in the world, uh, if it's an attack in London or an attack somewhere else or a threat in a third place, the media will focus on a particular risk. And much as uh, small children playing soccer or football all chase the ball, all the advice will suggest that we now ought to focus on railroads today or bus stations tomorrow or movie theaters on a third day. And it's quite obvious you can't do a sensible program where you simply move um, from one threat to another threat in a disorganized fashion, or where you say you're going to address every threat, which would require an infinite expenditure of resources. So we try to manage risk by identifying three characteristics. What is the consequence uh, if, a, if a threat comes to pass with respect to a particular target? What is the vulnerability of the target? And what is the nature of the threat, uh, both in terms of the intent that we discern on the part of our enemies and in terms of their capability? And if you look at things, for example, like a, a nuclear bomb, uh, in terms of consequence, that's probably the very top of the scale. In terms of capability, you know, there's a, fortunately, perhaps, uh, not that much capability at this point in time. But if that were to change, of course, there would be a huge impact on the overall risk. At the other end of the scale, there are um, single acts of violence that can occur, whether they are motivated by terrorism or something else, that are uh, certainly consequential to the victims, but not of the same order of magnitude, uh, and where there's a great deal of threat. Because, in fact, it's not very, very hard for someone to pick up a gun and go in and shoot somebody 
or detonate a small homemade IED. So how do we allocate where we put our resources? Well, we do look at these things, consequence, vulnerability, and threat, and we try to assess in a matrix, in effect, where we think some combination of these creates the greatest risk, and we then want to focus on those first. The second thing we ask is, where should we allocate the burden of addressing the risk? Clearly a risk of national significance, nuclear bomb, biological attack, is one that requires the federal government to take you know, front and center in leading the response and leading the prevention. Um, when you deal with smaller term or lower level risks, like, for example, a bomb in a shopping center or someone shooting people in a, in a marketplace, uh, particularly when we're talking about areas that are in private hands, there we do expect that some significant part of the cost is going to be borne by the person who owns the asset and who has responsibility for the continuity of the business, which is in question. That's not to say that the government doesn't help, but that we look to have a somewhat different sharing of the burden of dealing with the risk. That is, in general, in a general sense, our approach. Of course, in the application, everybody always has their own idea of how to weight these various characteristics. And not surprisingly, there's a great deal of focus on the part of, for example, shopping center owners on the risks to shopping centers. And that's why we try as much as possible to <clears throat> work in partnership and to make sure that the people who ought to be engaged in addressing risks are brought on board and working with us in terms of, of defining how we address the risks. Chemical plants are, are a good example of this in practice. Certainly, we can envision with certain kinds of chemicals. Uh, if someone were to attack a plant and blow it up or cause a fire, there might be a very significant consequence depending on the location of the plant. So we have a high consequence issue. The vulnerability may vary plant to plant. We know the threat is there because we know from 9-11 that terrorists look to use our own instruments of technology against us. So the question is, how do we allocate the burden of the risk? And here's where I think we're trying to use a philosophy of reasonableness. We clearly need to make sure the chemical industry steps up to the plate and addresses the risk, not only to its own business, but the risk to populations that are surrounding chemical plants. On the other hand, we don't want to impose unnecessary costs, and we don't want to dictate. So right now, there's legislation in Congress uh, that's being considered, and, and the approach we have generally taken is to say, uh, we ought to identify what are the chemicals that are most dangerous, and we ought to focus our efforts on the highest tier risks. Uh, when we do decide that uh, there has to be some kind of a mandatory regime of dealing with risks at the high end, we ought to be performance-based and not specify particular ways of doing things. In other words, we ought to say to plants, we want you to achieve certain results or get a certain level of protection, but we will not dictate to you how you get there. You choose, and then we will simply you know, assess whether you've achieved the result. And third, we look to involve the private sector in the process of validation. Uh, we don't necessarily need to validate everything ourselves, there's a possibility of third parties, like accounting firms, doing validation. So that's how we try to use risk management in the, con in the context of chemical security. Thank you. Well, the person uh, who must be awake at night the most in the group is uh, Mohammed <coughs> Al-Baradai, um, who is the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. When you uh, are up late at night and you can't sleep, do you worry about the possibility of um, unaccounted for weapons-grade material, either having come out of the former Soviet Union, where we all know the original accounting numbers were not that great, or possibly from uh, North Korea that has decided it needs some extra money? Um, uh, how real is that risk, and, and how wide awake should we be at night? Jim, you in particular should be wide awake. <laughs> well, I think, I think, Jamie, this is a panel when I trust no one of us will envy the other for having the job he holds, you know, because we, we all have, are in the very difficult business of managing risk, as Director Muller just, just mentioned. And uh, we live in, a, in an environment when the risk has increased colossally. You know, that's, that's part of the problem because either globalization, in, dissemination of technology, what have you, 
We also live in a world which is very much polarized, and we see that extremism is gaining ground in many parts of the world. You know, why that? That's another issue. I think it's primarily, in my view, they are mismanaged by their own government. They are mismanaged by the by the outside world. It's it's a deadly combination, in in, in my view. Uh, you simply you, you ask me the question: uh, Do we need to worry? Of course, we need to worry because I know there's a lot of material that could easily go into nuclear weapons that is all over the place. We know that the technology is how to weaponize is out of the tube. We know that terrorists are highly sophisticated and are interested in acquiring nuclear weapon or nuclear material to either to steal one or to make you know, a, a, a crude bomb. What you have to do is simply to cross your finger and prioritize. You know, and uh, as I always say that you have to you, we are running in a race against time. You know, I cannot give you a guarantee, but I can only, all I can tell you, we need to share information. We need to do our, our, our very best to make sure that we, we protect ourselves, protect humanity. Uh, but a lot needs to be done. Uh, uh, you know, we need a different framework, Jamie, for managing the nuclear technology, at least that's the area when I can talk about. I don't think every country should have easy access to enriched uranium or to plutonium. Uh, I'm sure some similar framework has to be in the chemical industry, in the biological industry. We need to have a new approach to how we manage these technologies that are of great benefit to us, but also have inherent risk. And uh, that we, we, we need at the end of the day, you know, and I, I would like to say that, not only deal with the symptoms, but we have to continue to deal with the causes. You know, we need to continue to address terrorism both as a symptom and as a cause. You know, and I think that's important. That's long run. You know, that's not our job, but our job is to deal with the short-term symptoms, and there are a lot of them. But we should not forget why do we have this extremism? Why do we have this chaotic system in which we, we see a lot of people are interested to acquire this weapon and to use it? That's round one. Uh, we have, I'm going to pose one more question uh, myself, and then all of you are welcome to ask your favorite uh, intelligence question that you have always wanted to ask, and maybe you'll even get an answer. Um, maybe. <laughs> the question, uh, in, since I'm now in the news business, is about the victory of Hamas. Now, I'd, since all of you are not uh, in, on the so-called political level, I, I don't expect you to answer, you know, what does this mean for relations between Hamas and Europe or the United States. But Hamas is a specific organization that has been labeled a terrorist organization by the United States and by the um, European Union. So now that this terrorist organization, and it could be a first, I'm not entirely sure, I, I think we'll have to look at that, has now been freely elected uh, to run a, a government, not of a country yet, but a government that's widely uh, dealt with. What complications can you foresee uh, in having a, a, a legally identified terrorist organization now uh, running a government? And I don't know who, you, we chatted a little bit before, I'm not sure anybody wants to jump out there, but if anybody does, I, th I think people would be interested. Why is everybody looking at me? It's, uh, <laughs> you're in the middle. Uh, I, I would say that uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization. And as Condi Rice may have, uh, I think, said before, Hamas has a choice to make. A number of people will be looking to see what choice is made by Hamas in the, in the forthcoming days. But our assumption is it's a terrorist organization is to be treated as such by, by us until uh, 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 something convinces us otherwise. Uh, the, uh, uh, as we talk about uh, the risks, I think each of us pre proceeds on the assumption uh, that things will get worse rather than better. Uh, you have to assume that uh, there will be suicide bombers. You have to assume that even though you have taken off, and by that I mean detained, uh, arrested, persons involved in cells in the United States, there are others that you are unaware of. What leaves you awake at night is that which you do not know, not that which you know and have uh, dealt with. Uh, and it could, uh, it's not just uh, al-Qaeda, and you mentioned before uh, UBL's latest uh, message that uh, of course causes us concern, uh, but it's also Hezbollah, uh, uh, Hamas, and the other terrorist groups that 
uh, from our perspective, uh, uh, may want to uh, operate within the United States, but also we have around the world uh, any number of American businesses and uh, embassies and interests that uh, also have in the past and could be in the future uh, attacked. And so, um, uh, getting back to the original uh, question about Hamas, it is a terrorist organization. Uh, we proceed on the assumption that it continues to be a terrorist organization. Well, it's bad enough to have the president of Iran question the existence of the Holocaust and suggest that Israel must be wiped off the map. Hamas doesn't recognize Israel, and it's very difficult to see how this will help the peace process, which is clearly essential for that part of the world first and foremost, but which is equally so important for global security and indeed also to some extent for countering terrorism. Hamas will have to change. Hamas cannot have it both ways. You cannot take part in a democracy, the essence of which is the peaceful resolution of conflict through argument, through dialogue, and be a violent organization, a terrorist organization. This organization is on the EU list of terrorist organizations. I don't see that reality changing. Therefore, we will be looking to see how Hamas will change. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience. I assume we have microphones. I can see there. Uh, there's one right here in the front. Thank you. My name is Jacques Markovic from Brazil. Uh, from what I understand, uh, terrorism is very much linked to other type of illicit type of activities. Uh, money laundry, drug traffic, and you have been defending a sharing of information. How far are we from the vision that you have? How far are we from sharing information in a level that we can feel a little bit more secure than we are today? Um, you deal, uh, Robert Mueller, with your colleagues all over the world. Do you, do you get what you need, or are there still places uh, where you think they should do more and they think you should do more? Well, first of all, we had to uh, look at what we do within the United States and break down both the, stat uh, the statutory like, walls, the uh, uh, other legal walls, uh, the cultural walls, uh, uh, to sharing information. And I believe we've come a very long way since September 11th in understanding that we cannot afford not to share. As Mr. DeVries said, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, what we look toward now initially is sharing as opposed to, uh, to keeping the information to ourselves. I would say the countries around the world have this false dichotomy that you cannot uh, I share law enforcement information with the intelligence side of the House or the intelligence side of the House with law enforcement. I think that's wrong. As you point out, terrorists, whether it be in Madrid or uh, uh, elsewhere, are involved in uh, uh, criminal activities, and information uh, relating to those criminal activities may well help prevent the next terrorist attack. And countries must look at their, uh, their, uh, their constitution, their statutes, uh, their cultural differences, in my mind, and break down those walls individually as we have started to do since September 11th. Does anyone? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think sharing of information is very important, and you are completely right. And I think we have achieved now a basis on sharing of information between the services, so which uh, would be, for me at least, unbelievable before September 11th. But uh, you can only share inform information if you have gained the information. And to gain the information is a very difficult task for uh, all the intelligence services. Gaining information on behalf of terrorist groups means that you have to run sources inside these groups. And that's very risky, very risky. It needs a lot of time. You have to be very cautious. And very often, they are very, they are very small groups. And we have seen it uh, in London. We have seen it in other places. And therefore, I think uh, sharing of information is very important. But gaining of, inf of information is uh, as important as uh, sharing of information. I think we can all agree with that. <laughs> uh, Amr Musa, please. Thank you, Jim. 
May I comment on the question you raised uh, or you introduced to the debate, which is the results of the Palestinian elections? Well, we have all, especially the U.S., promoted democracy. And we cannot promote democracy, then lament the results of democracy or object to the results of elections. Hamas, in the past, has been accused or dubbed as terrorist organization by certain countries, some countries, but this did not send any message to the Palestinian people who have their own uh, uh, life and their own difficulties. Now, I believe that the Hamas, if Hamas is going to form the government, when in the seat of authority, having the responsibility to govern, to negotiate, to reach peace, is different than Hamas, the organization whose people are in the streets or in, in, in different places. But in order to help Hamas and to help the next government in, in, in Palestine to move towards peace, as you know, it takes two to tango. We have to call. On the other side, Israel, after the elections due in one or two months, to help the other side, to help the Palestinians, whoever is in government, to move towards peace. So and the it, motto is peace for on the Palestinian side and on the Israeli side, whoever is in the government. Do you have any question you would like to pose to this panel, or we can move on? It's up to you. No, I have a question for Mohammed Bradai, but it will be bilateral. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right next to you, please. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Ernesto Kaiser from Newspaper El País from Spain. May I ask two questions to different people? This well, isn't a press conference, so <laughs> maybe you can just treat it as a topic and I'll figure yeah, out it's who topic. it's to then, okay? Okay, but I, uh, okay. I will address it uh, from Mr. Hanning and Mr. Muller first, and I have a second question for Mohamed el Baradei. Uh, in relationship with the sharing of information, there is a point, a very important point that I want to, to speak. We at El País made two weeks ago an interview in Ulm with a German citizen abducted, let's say, creatively by the CIA. I am speaking about Khaled El Masri. And he told us, and we published it in El País, that a German policeman interrogated him in Afghanistan. I would like to know your point of view about this matter your feelings about all the matter of Khaled al Masri. And secondly, I think that is a luxury to have here Mohammed al Baradei, because he is a prize Nobel, recently prize Nobel, and he ran the agency, as we know. I would like to know if he can elaborate or assess us about the situation, because there is an, a situation of escalation regarding Iran, and I want to know if he can assess us about the situation now. Thank you. Yes, uh, the Al-Masri case, you know, it's a great public discussion in Germany about uh, this Al-Masri case and the overall Europe on behalf of the so-called rendition practice. That has to do that there is a different view between the United States of America and most of the European countries how to deal with terrorism, uh, what kind of methods are allowed and what kind of methods are not allowed. Uh, and uh, we in Germany, we think that these, the so-called rendition should be not allowed. And there is a small difference uh, between the German government and the US government. On behalf uh, of El Mastri, there is a bilateral discussion and uh, discussion in our parliament. I don't believe, and I have no evidence, that uh, German policemen, German uh, intelligence officers uh, have uh, been involved in this case. I know that uh, Masri is claiming that German-speaking people have uh, interrogated him, but uh, we, uh, according to our investigation in Germany, personally, I'm quite sure that no German police or law enforcement has been involved in this case. Well, that's clear enough, Mohammed. If I could narrow the, the Iran question just a little bit because of the nature of, of this discussion. Uh, do you believe that uh, 
the issue of Iranian uh, nuclear weapons is now getting uh, the necessary attention of the world, and do you believe it is time to take it to the Security Council? Jamie, let me say one thing before I, I get into Iran, and I will not get much into Iran, but uh, on the question of Hamas, which you raised, it, ra it, it actually bring to light a very fundamental question. When you have extremist groups, whatever you call them, in government, do you isolate or do you engage? That's, it's, not, it's not the only place you have a government like Hamas, you know. And whatever your perception, you know, uh, people are not born terrorists, you know. But do you isolate them or do you try to engage them to move hearts and minds? That's a fundamental question we are facing in many places, you know. It's not only it's not only in, in the Palestinian territory. However, on, on Iran, I think, I still believe that we need to find a formula by which Iran go back to the negotiation. You know, whether you go to the Security Council or not, that's a policy judgment, have to be made by the member state. But even if you go to Security Council, I think everybody understand that you, Ultimately, you need to go back to the negotiating table because the Iranian issue is, is not just about nuclear. It's about regional security. It's about economic issues. It's about human rights issues. So what you are having now is people are trying to use the maximum of diplomacy, and diplomacy including the Security Council, if you like. You know. And the discussion right now, is it the time to go now to Security Council? Is it beginning of February, end of February, uh, this month, you know, uh, that these are questions being debated right this, this moment. Uh, however, I still believe that we need, Iran need to show maximum transparency because there's a lot of question mark about its program. Uh, Iran need to be assured that they can use nuclear power for electricity, but the international community need to be assured that the Iranian program is exclusively for peaceful purpose. I think the whole issue that focuses on enrichment, as I've said before, Iran probably needs to go through a rehabilitation period you know, by which it will accept that they will not engage in enrichment on their own territory while at the same time you know, make sure that they get what they need uh, for their own peaceful purpose. And that's why the Russian proposal is a very attractive proposal. I was happy today to see Mr. Larijani, the National Security Council, saying that the Russian proposal is a positive one and they are continuing to discuss it. So I'm still very hopeful that the time is not over before we can move the parties or create the condition to go back into negotiation. But whether we'll go to Security Council uh, next week, next month, it, it remains to be seen, you know, on, again, on, on many factors. As I said, we are we having a team right now in, in Tehran, you know, looking into trying to clarify outstanding issues. There is a discussion in Russia on the Russian proposal. So there's lots of issues at stake. And, but the international community, I think, is quite united that they do not want to see Iran having nuclear weapons, or any other country, frankly, for that matter. You know, we still have eight or nine countries having nuclear weapons. And, and in my view, you know, this, as I said before, eight and nine too many. So we need to move toward nuclear disarmament and not to increase the, the number of nuclear weapons and, and reach you know, the prediction of Kennedy, President Kennedy, who said that we will have 15, 20 nuclear weapon states. Well, that's the beginning of the end for me, if we have that. Then you'll never get any sleep. Sorry? Then you'll never get any sleep. <laughs> Absolutely. And hopefully I'll not be there. <laughs> yes, please. Um, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, Dr. Albaradai, following up on what you said, um, on, first, on the Russian proposal, um, there's supposed to be a meeting sometime in, in February um, between the Russians and the Iranians. Are you hopeful, optimistic that this might produce uh, some kind of an agreement that could uh, perhaps bring down the temperature of this dispute. And on the broader issue of what can really be done by the international community to change the whole regime and come up with 
a new way of dealing with uh, nuclear material, biological and chemical material. Um, what realistically are the prospects, particularly in light of the fact that at the UN summit in September, the nations of the world couldn't even agree on a single paragraph on this issue to put in the final document? Evelyn, I, I think if you, if, you are in, if you are in my job, you absolutely have to be no matter what it is. Otherwise, my wife will walk away. So, uh, however, you know, uh, I can tell you absolutely, uh, in the nuclear area, we need to have a different framework. I've been talking about a new framework. Not every country should sit on an enrichment factory or a reprocessing factory that is too close for comfort, because if you have the material, you have the weapon in a few months. Uh, I have gotten a good response. The U.S. said they are ready to help me establish a bank to provide guarantees of supply. The Russian yesterday, President Putin, said that he's ready to establish an international enrichment center in Russia. So uh, we are, uh, the nuclear threat initiative, you know, Sam Nunn and Ted Turner said they are ready to give us millions of dollars, you know, to help us build that bank. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of understanding in the international community that something ought to be done. On, on Iran, and I don't really ever want to speak much on Iran, but I think, Yes, I am hopeful that the Russian proposal could provide the beginning of a solution. Uh, the Europeans are still very keen to go back to negotiation. The Iranians saying they're still very keen to go back to negotiation. Even all the European and the US who are saying that we want to go to the Security Council, they're saying we want Security Council to add a new phase of diplomacy, as Secretary Rice mentioned. So everybody's still talking about diplomacy. And, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that as long as we talk about diplomacy, as long as we're not talking about enforcement measures, sanction, etc., we are on the right track. But we need to accelerate the process. We need to understand that, as I've said before, if we, ac if we escalate, everybody will hurt. Uh, let me pose a, a question more broadly to the panel. Uh, the thing that I think uh, Robert Mueller said keeps everybody awake at night or ought to at some point is this prospect of a terrorist with a nuclear weapon. We've all watched the James Bond movies. We've all uh, seen the more modern, sophisticated, realistic versions of those movies. Can anyone uh, talk about whether you believe there is a system in place to uh, identify that some threat is a nuclear weapon and that there is a system in place to try to minimize the potential damage from that weapon, the kind of fictional uh, examples we've all seen in the movies. Is there a, a non-fiction version that at least some part of which some of you could share with us? <clears throat> well, I, uh, in terms of the last question, which is, is there some way to mitigate the damage? Uh, and there's not a lot of mitigation if a nuclear bomb is detonated in a downtown city. That's, a, by the way, a little different than a radiological bomb, which has a large psychological component. But I think the focus of at least our efforts in terms of the nuclear threat is prevention. Um, at the margin, there might be some way to protect people, you know, outside the blast zone, and there might be some things you could do for people at some distance to mitigate the harm. But I think it would be, by any measure, <clears throat> the single most catastrophic thing that could happen. I think we, we try to take a layered approach to this. Ideally, we would capture um, and render uh, inoperative any loose nuclear material that's out there. And at the same time, we would work very hard to make sure people aren't creating their own nuclear devices, either in states that would then make them available to terrorists or even terrorist groups working, as we've seen historically, um, you know, some efforts having been made through networks. So clearly the number one thing is reach out overseas and, and nip it in the bud. The second element of what we do, of course, is, is really invest in technology on detection to try to prevent anything nuclear from coming into the United States. And we do that uh, actually overseas through initiatives we have at many of the ports of embarkation where we have not only intelligence-driven screening, but we have ra uh, radioactive detection equipment that can detect emissions and then give us an opportunity to get into a, uh, into a container, for example, and look to see if there's something dangerous. So all of these things are um, imperfect measures of defense, but in the aggregate, hopefully give us a pretty robust 
um, sense of defense overall. I, I personally think the biggest danger we face is a nation state developing a bomb, because I still think to do a bomb, you need the kind of capability typically you find in a nation, and then making that bomb available to somebody who is not inhibited in using it. That is, I think, the nightmare scenario. I think there are bad and good news. The good news is that uh, we, the intelligence services, don't have any indication that uh, nuclear weapons have been stolen or have been out of control in the nuclear weapon states, uh, Russia, Pakistan, or elsewhere. No indication. And you're confident this. about your assessment of the former Soviet Union's uh, original as, stockpile? As well, as well. Uh, yes, of course, they have had some problems on behalf of controlling uh, nuclear, uh, let me say, uh, yes, nuclear material, but not nuclear weapons. We don't have had any, any indication in the past. And I think, yes, we have a very good uh, regime. We, they are well guarded, and therefore, that's not my main fear. Uh, my main fear is, and that's the bad news, that Osama bin Laden has uh, claimed in the past, yes, my organization tries the, the utmost to get a nuclear weapon, uh, an Islamic nuclear weapon, and I remember 1998 and uh, later on, but the good news is that it's very difficult to handle nuclear weapons. And therefore, I don't believe that uh, that is a real threat in the short run. In the long run, maybe, maybe, and I agree uh, with Mr. Chatham, if there are more and more states which uh, are in the possession of nuclear weapons, that will, of course, uh, higher the risk that uh, organizations could be in the possession or could come in the possession of nuclear weapons. I think that's a nightmare for the, for the future. And therefore, I think we have to do our utmost to uh, uh, support the non-proliferation regime and to, to support all these efforts uh, from uh, EIO and other international organizations. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd concur with that. And perhaps just to, to broaden the, the scope a little bit, we, we really have to invest further in strengthening the multilateral system we have to prevent proliferation. That is partly to do with nuclear weapons uh, and, and such not, but it's also to do with chemical and biological weapons, and it has to do with small arms and light weapons, conventional arms. We have the IEA, and the European Union has increased its aid to the IEA. We have in The Hague the Chemical Weapons Agency, and the EU has similarly increased its aid to that agency to help it strengthen the chemical proliferation regime. But we do not have a similar agency, a monitoring agency, in the biological field. That strikes me as a serious chink in our armor. We've had these negotiations before. They have not been successful. I think this is an issue to which we need to return to see if we cannot strengthen that regime. But meanwhile, let us do everything we can to have global ratification and implementation of the existing United Nations instruments. There are many countries in the world that have yet to ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention or the Biological Weapons Convention. Now, that is only one part of the answer. But if you do not have a universal support for these instruments, international cooperation is that much more difficult. And finally, let us not forget about small arms and light weapons which are often called the poor man's weapons of mass destruction. The world is awash in these weapons. There are things we cannot do. There are a lot of things that we can do to improve, for example, import and export controls, notably to reduce the risk of illicit trade in such weapons. We have a UN instrument there. Again, it needs to be implemented. And one of the options the EU is considering is to make that instrument legally binding within the European Union. There's a lot that we can do across the board still to strengthen the proliferation regimes. Yes. My name is Gillian Caldwell. I'm from the United States. And one of the things that keeps me up at night is that I see uh, Homeland Security and other relevant branches of government taking what I see as a primary focus on the symptoms of the problem. And I guess my question would be, what 
kind of conversations taking place regarding the root causes of terrorism and what discussion is, being, is, is going on between security apparatus and other relevant portions of government to address the root causes of terrorism? <clears throat> well, we certainly focus on the symptoms because the symptoms kill you. And our first obligation here is to make sure people don't get killed. But we do focus, uh, we're trying to focus as well on what the root causes are. Um, there is a lot of study going on in the United States now. We actually have funded some of that study um, through a university. Um, and there are also studies overseas on the issue of radicalization, what takes people, uh, particularly people in Western societies, and so transforms them, transforms them that they are willing to strap on a bomb and kill themselves and kill other people. That is a fairly significant step for a person to take. Uh, and obviously, we want to understand that phenomenon. We want to work with communities, uh, ethnic communities, um, to make sure that um, moderate messages, that uh, messages that emphasize resolving issues peacefully are being supported and being endorsed. Uh, in order to counteract what appears to be at least the um, siren song that some feel from extreme groups and radical groups. So we do focus on that, but uh, as I say, in the short run, uh, the symptoms kill you, and we have to not lose sight of that fact. Yes, over there, please. I have a question for Mr. Hanek, please. I don't understand what he means by Islamic bomb, Islamic nuclear weapon. Do we have a Christian one or a Jewish one? <laughs> what, what, what's the meaning of the label? I was only referring to Osama bin Laden himself. But that's not is Islamic, is Islam, okay? He, so you cannot label nuclear weapons as Islamic. It, the one I, used I in Hiroshima have, I have was a Christian? I repeated his words. Uh, <laughs> if it okay. had been me, I would have said I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> Others? Yes, right there in the middle of the room, waving his hand. I, it looks like Aaron Miller. Uh, Aaron Miller, Washington, D.C. Um, effective counterterrorism is a difficult and complicated business. There's a military component, there's an intelligence component, there's a public relations component, but it's also generational in character. This problem is probably the greatest threat to the West and to my country, and it will be one that will confront my children's generation. So I'd like the, to ask the two Americans on the panel, what is my government doing to prepare the younger generation, my kids, uh, who are in their 20s, to understand the seriousness of the threat and also to understand its complexity, to avoid politics and political slogans, and to make them fully aware of how comprehensive our response and how smart our response has to be. What are you doing and what should you doing, be doing to, to prepare the next generation? Why don't you start? I, I think the most important thing we need to, uh, uh, to protect uh, my children, my grandchildren, your children, your grandchildren, is to look 10, 15, 20 years ahead at the landscape that we will see uh, 20 or 30 years ahead. and. Uh, start preparing our institutions, changing our institutions to address those threats. For us, uh, it's develop understanding the impact of globalization that will increase uh, uh, substantially as, uh, as we go along. The, the ability of the, uh, the internet, uh, wire tra transfers, uh, jet travel, uh, to make this uh, uh, basically one large state and uh, to uh, look forward 10, 15, 20 years, what do we need in the FBI to address that? It means we need persons with different backgrounds, different cultures, different languages, different skills, scientists, engineers, and the like to address the threats that we'll see down the road. It requires us, as we have, established legal attache offices around the world so that we network around the world, understanding that it's not just the United States, uh, but it's each country that faces this threat down the world, and the only way we can be successful is working together. So from our perspective, it's looking down the road to see how we can better protect not only our citizens, but the citizens of the world against uh, ideologues who have, uh, have uh, from right or left, uh, who believe that uh, it's okay to kill uh, 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 women and children. 
Since I'm an American living in London, I'm going to ask whether the Europeans are doing anything about this. You wanted to comment, Guy. Well, um, I'd like to strike a bridge with a previous question, which was about root causes. I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with the notion of root causes because it suggests a nice linear causal relationship between a cause and terrorism. I think as we explore the phenomenon of terrorism, we're finding that no such simple relations exist. But there are contributing factors. And there is no doubt that a lack of good governance in countries can feed into a sense of frustration that can help create circumstances in which radicalization and recruitment take place. Similarly, the questions of poverty, the questions of a lack of economic, social, and political opportunity, even though there is no direct link with terrorism, do have an indirect relationship. So if we look at a generational answer to the questions facing us today, let us not forget that we will have to have a dual strategy. We need to address the law and order questions that will help us prevent terrorist attacks today and tomorrow. But we equally have to invest in a world where circumstances are addressed that may feed into processes of radicalization and recruitment. And that includes addressing some of the world's big conflicts, Iraq, but also the Middle East peace process. And let us not forget about Afghanistan. Things have gone wrong there before. We have a duty to help that country prevent a return to those previous circumstances. All those must be part of a long-term answer. I, I agree with what uh, Bob Mueller said. I'm not going to repeat it. There are two additional things I think we need to do to prepare uh, our, our children, and I don't have grandchildren yet, but anybody else's grandchildren for this challenge in the future. One is we have to build a sustainable architecture for how we balance security and privacy and freedom over a long period of time. There's a little bit of a tendency historically for the pendulum to swing fairly widely back and forth. Right after an event, it goes very high on the security side, then it swings way back in a reaction. We can't afford to, to uh, take a chance on the pendulum being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we have to really uh, complete this discussion of wh where the right balance is and understand that you know when we strike the balance, we're accepting certain risks and then build something that we can live with for an extended period of time. The second thing is, I think in the long run, going back to this issue of nuclear biological threats, these are the threats that are transformative threats. We've lived with bombs before. They are conventional bombs. Conventional bombs are bad, but they don't destroy a society. A nuclear bomb would be a, uh, a society wrecking event. And as the technology changes over the next 10 or 20 years, we are going to have to get very engaged um, internationally uh, eliminating those threats as they become more and more dispersed. My observation about terror is not that fundamentally people are different now than they were 200 years ago or 600 years ago or 1,000 years ago. It's that the leverage a single individual has has dramatically increased through the destructive power of technology. And the more that increases, the more we're going to have to act to prevent it from getting in the wrong hands. Mohammed, August Hanning posed the uh, great risk of an existing nuclear power choosing to sell a weapon or the key ingredients for a weapon uh, to a terrorist organization. That's the big one. There is such a country right now, uh, North Korea, who has shown a willingness to sell most any product to most anybody, whether that's counterfeit bills or uh, government-made methamphetamine. Do you uh, believe that the risk of North Korea selling a nuclear bomb to some organization is, is high? And do you believe the world is doing enough about it? Well, Jamie, I know one thing. You know, when we talked about symptoms and causes, and we are all dealing with symptoms, and obviously we have to deal with law and order. But I know one thing. We have three conflict that have been going on at least for 50, 60, 70 years. That's the Korean issue, Middle East issue, South Asia, Kashmir issue. If you fix these three issues, in my view, at least in my area, 80, 90% of the proliferation threat will go away. So there is the issue of 
the, the driving force for proliferation, which we need to, we need to understand. It's not easy. It's not, it's not at all uh, uh, something we, we can see overnight. But it is unacceptable, frankly, from my perspective, to see conflict going on for 60, 70 years. You know, I mean, that's, you know, the driving force for extremism, and I think could be a lot. There's a lot of contribution. My, my personal take on it, it's really the sense of humiliation. You know, it's, not, it's not just poverty, it's a sense of injustice and humiliation. Lots of that is taking place both on the hands of national governments, you know, lack of good governance, suppression of human rights. Lots of that is coming also from the outside. And if you have it coming both ways, you, know, you see a lot of extremism. So I'm not saying this is a long-term road. It doesn't, doesn't really make us very comfortable because we need still to deal with the short-term threats. But North Korea is a case in point. You know, you need to fix it. You know, North Korea has been going on for years and years. North Korea have, you know, have been reported to Security Council 19 that they are in non-compliance. And in 2005, they, you know, they're still there. They say we have nuclear weapons, and we need the, er the, the earlier we fix the problem, the better for everybody. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I see someone waving so politely right there. We'll have to go there. Rob Flaherty from New York. I wanted to ask about the interplay between government and corporations. Secretary Chertoff mentioned the need to share the burden, and Mr. DeVries mentioned the, the need to share. Um, <clears throat> with corporations growing so much in their pervasiveness and global reach and increased sophistication and size, um, and because of this need to share, what possibilities do you see for this being a cooperative exercise in addressing global risks? Hey, let me just, uh, there was a panel on this morning about uh, cyber attacks. Uh, not only do we need partnerships between ourselves, state and local law enforcement within the United States, with the intelligence community and with our counterparts overseas, but uh, private and public. Uh, I, I, the, the threats of cyber attacks, uh, denial of service attacks, viruses, worms, uh, uh, the uh, identity theft. In order to be uh, successful in addressing these enhanced threats, there has to be um, uh, public-private uh, uh, relationships, uh, uh, interchanges, and an understanding that we have to work together in areas such as this. Counterterrorism in the same way, in terms of protecting our facilities and being vigilant. Uh, alerting uh, uh, us to things that seem out of, out of uh, 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 somewhat different. And it's uh, across the world, and we need these, I would say, public-private uh, relationships and shared responsibility of addressing the threats that face us. Well, I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion, and just to offer one brief comment of my own. If we don't want the pendulum to swing too far in one direction or another, it's really important that uh, one doesn't uh, call your critics uh, weak or unpatriotic, and one doesn't call your critics uh, and question their patriotism just because they disagree with you. That helps create a national consensus, and that's how you avoid the pendulum going too far in one direction. That's just my personal opinion. Thank you all for coming.